Well, good morning. What I want to do now is go over the second verse, first chapter of the Sefer Yetzirah. Uh, the first verse had so much stuff in it. I had to break it up into two parts, but this one's going to be shorter. Guaranteed. So uh, let me go ahead and see if I can share my screen here. Okay, and it looks like we're good to go. Sefer Yetzirah 1.2. That's Book of Creation or Formation, uh, depending upon how you prefer to translate that. Okay, as usual, I start with the Hebrew, and then I have uh, Rabbi Kaplan's uh, translation, and then I have my own translation here. Oops, let's go back. So, uh, Rabbi, the late Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan translates this as 10 sefirot of nothingness and 22 foundation letters, three mothers, seven doubles, and 12 elementals. Okay, we're introduced to this word sefirot for the first time, and uh, we'll talk about that more uh, in the slides that follow. And I'll explain why I think it really means or should be translated as declarations. And likewise, the word bulima, which is usually rendered as nothingness, I'll explain why that should be, uh, in this context, probably translated as constraint. So my translation is 10 declarations of constraint and 22 letters of foundation, three mothers and seven doubles and 12 planes. And as I just said, oh, I'm skipping ahead. Let me skip back. There we go. As I said a moment ago, uh, in this passage, we encounter for the first time a strange new word, sefirot. Also, the fact that this is a manufactured word suggests that at times in reading this text, we should consider its words as coded and thus search for similar words with the same root in order to unlock the true connotation. In this case, the three-letter Hebrew word of sefirot is samak pe resh, and that's the same as the words sefer, safar, and sipur that we saw in the previous verse. And several explanations have been given as to its meaning. Remember in the previous verse, in the first verse, we had sefer translated as book, safar as number, and sipur as communication, and those uh, relate to the functions of the right brain. Uh, let's see, I think we also said safer is story, right brain, so far number, left brain, see poor communication between the two hemispheres of the brain. Okay, now on the one hand, it seems to definitely be re related to so far, the word for number. And this makes sense because the number of safety road is 10. And they're supposed to mirror or be the 10 creative utterances of God. Those 10 utterances by which God created the universe in the first chapter of Genesis. Similarly, the term sefirot could simultaneously be linked to the three Hebrew words for story, number, and communication that are given in the first passage of this text. And those are the words uh, sefer, safar, and sipur that we just talked about. In this way, sefirot could represent the essential creative process. And interestingly, I don't have it in, in today's slideshow, but I may put it in another slideshow. There's a place in the Zohar where um, it says that these 10 creative utterances can actually be reduced to just three. And it gives that triad not as story, number, and communication, but as wisdom, uh, understanding, and knowledge, which also refer to right brain, left brain, and the interaction of the two. Okay. Now, others, however, also see a link between the word sefirot and the word sapir, which means sapphire especially the sapphire of God's throne in the vision of Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel 10.1, it says, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament, 
that was above the head of the cherubim appeared over them something like a sapphire stone, in appearance like the shape of a throne. However, I also think there's an important link between the words sephirot and supreme, which we'll translate as declare. And this makes good sense because the 10 creative utterances by which God created the universe can also be thought of as declarations. And this is the point of view that is found in the Bahir, that classic uh, summary of Jewish mysticism that was uh, uh, published in, let's say, I believe, uh, the 12th century. So, from the Bahir uh, 125, why are they called Sefirot? Because it's written in Psalm 19 to you, the heavens declare, may supreme the glory of God. So that is ju good justification for someone like me to translate 10 sefirot as meaning 10 declarations. Okay. In summary, it is quite possible that since sefirot is a manufactured word that the author of the Sefer Yetzirah intended for it to embrace many interpretations. Also, the word sefirot is a plural word with a feminine ending, and this may be a reflection of the author's position as seen elsewhere in the text that when trying to establish an order of events to creation, the feminine in the context of a mother giving birth comes before the masculine, at least as the author of the Sefer Yetzirah sees it, and as most cultures see it, as has often been said, everything is born of woman. Now, the word belima that I've translated in this passage as constraint is frequently translated as nothingness. It's literally belima, without what. Nonetheless, belima appears to also be related to the verb balam, to restrain. In the Bible, this word appears only once in Job 26, 7, where we usually read in translation that God hangs the earth upon nothing. However, this verse could also be translated as God hangs the world upon restraint. And this interpretation is supported by the verses that follow that explicitly discuss the boundaries that God places upon creation. In fact, if you go back to Genesis, uh, you also find boundaries. You have God separates the land from the sea and he places boundaries on things so that they don't become all muddled up again. So, the bottom line is that in order for a finite world to exist, every component must be finite. This interpretation of Bolima as being restraint is also suggested by the Talmud, and in context, it is more likely that the Sefirot are meant to be restrictions upon the infinity of God so that a finite world can exist. Now, the original meaning of infinity in ancient times was having no boundaries, something unbounded. And because it's unbounded, it goes on forever, like space is infinite. It appears to us as having no limits or boundaries upon it. And the contrast to that is for something to have limits and boundaries. And so everything that was finite was seen as being bounded or limited in some respect. And Restrictions are put upon the infinity of God, so again, a finite world can exist. And here is a, a relevant verse from uh, Job, chapter 26, verses 7 through 14. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth upon, in our translation, restraint. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds, see, restraining. And the cloud is not torn under them. He closes in the face of his throne and spreads his cloud upon it. He has surrounded the waters with bounds. Again, boundaries, limits. At the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He stirs up the sea with his power and by his understanding he struck Rahab. By his wind he has made the heavens fair. His hands slew the fleeing serpent. 
Behold, these are but parts of his ways, but how terrifying is the thing that is heard of him, and who can understand the thunder of his power? Okay, that's very interesting. We read in this verse that, uh, as I translated, God hangs the earth upon restraint. The earth is created through restraint. And he puts boundaries upon things. And uh, in rabbinic literature, one of the great sages of the Talmud, Rav Huna, he points out that uh, all we can see are but parts of the ways of the Holy One. So those parts that have been made finite, that's what we can experience. That's what we can perceive. Uh, the infinite, that which is unbounded, we may sense it, touch upon it in some ways, but we certainly don't see it the same way we see all these objects before us, all of them which have boundaries. Okay, and finally, here is a quote from the Talmud from Tractate Hulin, page 89a. Rabbi Ilya said, the world exists only on account of the merit of him who restrains himself in strife. For it is written, he hangs the earth upon Bulima, by which he means restraint. So here we see this Talmudic rabbi uh, translating this word Bulima as meaning restraint, because it, he sees it as coming from the word Balaam, meaning to stop or restrain something. Okay, that is it. So let me stop sharing here. And that concludes uh, this uh, uh, presentation. So we'll have, uh, let's, let's see, that's our second verse in the first chapter of the Sefer Yetzirah. So next time we'll see the third verse. Shalom.